Okay. <clears throat> so, I want to talk about how difficult it might be to evolve language, human style language, and why that might actually mean we're alone in the universe. Which, hopefully evolution is not an uncomfortable topic, but being alone in the universe might be. So, this is the famous Drake equation. Uh, which says there's so many stars and each star is likely to have planets and each planet has a probability of life So where are they? Uh, and I don't know why this is supposed to be a whole alien, but anyway <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, <clears throat> Technology definitely needs I think language. I should say this is all quite speculative. There's holes all through my argument But I think it's clear that technology needs the ability to do arbitrary symbols uh, now what are the origins of language? No one knows, actually. It's the hardest problem in science, arguably. Um, and uh, so I'm going to propose that the origins of language are in sexual selection because nothing else could do it. <laughs> okay, some animals have very complicated communication structures, like uh, prairie dogs can communicate all sorts of things about the predators. Uh, but that seems to be instinctive. That's one of the possible holes in my presentation. Humans can invent languages and communicate them to each other. Animals are capable of learning words, but they don't invent words as far as we know. Um, and so the question is why not? Why are we the only species that seems to invent words and grammar and the whole structure of symbolic language? Okay, so language must have evolved. We didn't get 100,000 words in 100 languages. Uh, you know, it, it had to start from, from somewhere. And what I'm going to argue is that the start of language was very, very difficult to bridge from pre-linguistic grunts and squeaks, uh, and uh, that, that meanings are hard to transmit accurately unless you have enough words. So, yeah, as I was saying, <laughs> you know, she, she's going to learn language because she's going to hear established language. But if all we had was like five grunts, the, the meaning of those grunts would not be clear, I argue. Or it would be clear but too specific and couldn't lead to language. So, if you have imperfect copies of something, that, uh, then the copying and selection doesn't work. To get perfect copies, you need digital copies. Uh, analog copies are just sort of inherently imperfect. Um, I put the fish up there to say I'm not trying to modify or disagree with evolutionary theory as it exists. This is maybe a slight extension of it, but as far as I know, it's kosher. Um, so this is an analog computer, which you can see the things would slip a little bit. Uh, this is a digital computer. It has uh, ratchets and detents and all sorts of things so that the numbers are precise. Uh, it's a mechanical digital computer. So, how were the first words transmitted? When, if, if you had someone who knew just ten words and that was all they had access to, how could they be transmitted? How could you say, that's a chair, not a couch? If all you had was animal, vegetable, or mineral, what is this leather-bound, gold-leafed paper book? Uh, now, my argument specifically is you need enough words to, to fill your concept space. You need like a, an identifiable word for each color here. And you could just say red, green, blue. You could say, well, this is more of a, a, a mauve over here. However many words you have, you need enough to spend not just the concept space of colors, but of living arrangements, hunting, fire. This is pictographs, and you can see how complicated it gets, even for a Stone Age culture. Now, Google Translate uses m hundreds of dimensions to encode the meaning that it encodes. The smallest invented language that seems to work, Tokipona, has 123 words. Um, and so what I'll argue is that you can't have like 10 words passed down from one generation to another because of language. It has to be sexual selection, which can produce patterns, extremes, and extremes of human behavior. And so if we had something like dance or like birdsong uh, that, that could have made it evolutionarily fit, but not for any practical purpose except reproduction, to transmit 10 words, 30 words, 50 words, uh, 
as birdsong can be learned sometimes, uh, that might have been enough to bridge the chasm to, to reach enough meanings to fill the conceptual space to be a self-propagating, self-correcting language. Thank you. I see some major skepticism from Russell here. Uh, so go, go ahead and, and poke holes in it. <laughs> So how does the phenomena of, twi of twins languages fit in this? Uh, well, I would say that twins hear language uh, long before they develop their own language. And so they're, they have the external patterning of their brain along linguistic lines. Also, we have co-evolved with language for 100,000 years or so. So it's possible that our brains are better at inventing languages than the proto-caveman brains would have been. We do have specific areas in our brain now for language, which couldn't have arisen until we had language. <laughs> <laughs> so how does that fit in with the throwing Madonna hypothesis? Um, remind me which hypothesis that is. So that's saying that the key part of language is being able to differentiate phonemes, which takes very fine divisions in time. And as we learn to throw better, that's released in very fine divisions in time. So the need to do better and better throwing is what gave us the brain structure that let us do phonetic processing and from their language. Uh, I would argue that sign language does not require such fine distinctions. Apes can sign. And so I don't think the, I mean, it's quite possible that throwing was necessary to get big enough brains to be capable of language. Something I didn't have time to say is, we have birds that do all sorts of smart things, but maybe their brains just aren't big enough for language. Maybe you need sexual selection in a species that's already fairly big-brained. So you're, you're adding improbabilities to the, to the chasm of getting a linguistic species. Maybe it's a lack of lips. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, parrots, parrots talk about lips. Um, hey, do you want me to hold you? <laughs> Give me a little bit. Oh, she, she wants more milk. She wants more milk, I bet. That, that's probably her hungry cry. It's really hard to know. See, oh, she, can, really hard to she can communicate. She can communicate pretty well, uh, but only a few concepts, only instinctually. Not, I want cold water, or I want warm water. Right. Yes. How is this an argument for why we might be alone in the universe? Ah, my argument... Yes. It, I should have made that clearer if I'd had five minutes and 20 seconds. <laughs> uh, basically, basically, the idea is it's so hard to evolve from grunts and squeaks into proto language that maybe we're the only species in the universe who's ever done it, or at least the only species within our light cone that is as far back in time as we can see. What about the septopods? Cephalopods? No. Septopods. Uh, that's science fiction. Pop yeah. culture. <laughs> 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 it's a recent movie by Aliens. Oh, yes. Movie. When you talk about the, uh, with the sexual yeah. evolution of language, <laughs> like what are you really talking about that? Because like that would incite, like, mean the combination of two words into a new word, but that's German. Oh, basically, what, <laughs> <laughs> what I'm suggesting is that, like, bowerbird bowers are incredibly complicated. They can sort things by color, shape, size, you know, arrange them. There's no obvious fitness purpose. And so, what I'm, and, and humans dance, and dance may very well have preceded language. Uh, what I'm arguing is that when we had a proto-linguistic structure of, say, two dozen words, that that wouldn't have been enough to, even if, if, even if each of those words was useful, the meanings would not have propagated successfully from one person to another unless there was something, something driving a selection pressure for, for, for extra precision and structure, as we see in peacock tails and bowerbird bowers. So you weren't talking about sexual evolution of the language, it was that we were 
as part of our sexual evolution, we're fighting right. these right. guys. So <laughs> we're getting stronger by... <laughs> uh, that, that's selection for a different thing. Um, but but uh, given that most of us aren't Mick Jagger, I think probably we, we didn't have that strongly selected for. Uh, some some subgroups of us were selected for jumping and running, some were selected maybe for, uh, you know, weird pale skin colors or something. Um, but... Uh, I, basically, I'm suggesting that sometime in our ancestry, someone was attracted to words, words to, to yes. proto words as structured <laughs> and clear as bird song, but with no other reason for their clarity. Yes. Couldn't it be that communication was more important, maybe for hunting and protection from, uh, right. to defend them, uh, themselves from predators? Well, I mean, we can see with prairie dogs, uh, they have complicated means of communication, but as far as I can tell on a very quick read, uh, it's instinctive. And I'm not saying that, instinct that instincts can't develop complicated communication, but the whole grammar thing, the whole ability to invent words and communicate what they mean, the ability to say, this word means this, to describe words in terms of other words, uh, I don't think animals do that. Yes? Is there any kind of realistic comparison or rubric for trying to, you know, say like human language versus prairie dog language? Uh, I'm sure there are many, um, many dimensions on which human language differs. Human language talks about more things, almost certainly has more flexible grammar. Um, humans, different, different groups of humans can invent different languages in like a hundred years. Um, did I say we have a lot more words? Because we have a lot more words. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does that start to answer? Uh, sort of, yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, sort of along those lines. So, I mean, like, have you tied this into any, um, looking at any, like, differences in the brain, brain physiology between a human and creature? So, like, even as humans, we have this reptilian brain that's instinctual yeah. and primal. Then we have this developed neocortex that holds emotions and all of these other things. Right. So uh, the great apes have most of the same brain we do. It's smaller. It doesn't have the language areas, as far as we know, the Broca's area and, and Wernicke's. Is that how you pronounce it? Anyway. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Wernicke's area. Um, and so my thinking is that those that, that a few of our brain structures have, have become specialized to help us be better at language. Uh, wh which is, I guess, evidence that language is hard, because if it were easy, we wouldn't need extra brain structures to deal with it. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add a tidbit of interesting information. Please. So, um, as far as like the names of colors go, different cultures, um, depending on sort of their backgrounds and what their landscape is like that they live in, have different colors in their language that they even recognize. And so there are even some groups that have so few colors um, that they you know, they only recognize, you know, like a green and a red and a black or something like that. And, um, yeah. and they just, they know one is darker or one is not, but they don't have the language for it because it's not necessary. Um, but sort of an interesting thing about the evolution of color and language is that the, across the world, different languages came up with the same names for colors or came up with names for colors in the same order. Mm -hmm. So it all started with black, white, and then it went red. Mm -hmm. And then um, green and yellow were fairly standard and, and kind of close to one another and almost the same. And then blue and other things came way later after that. Huh, interesting. Yeah. Um, I would say, uh, as I showed in the rainbow slide, it doesn't really matter how you divide up the space as long as you have a name for everything in the space. So if, if I could point to this part of the rainbow and say, what color is this? And you go, um, uh, I don't know. Then, then it's going to be hard to tell your kids, well, OK, this is red, this is green, and this, uh, I don't know. And so, so the definition of green is going to be you know, the dividing line between green and, and some color you can't name is going to be fuzzy. Mm. Uh, and that's basically why I'm saying if you don't have enough words to fill your conceptual space, language, proto-language is analog because the definitions will be poorly, uh, poorly delineated. 
when you get enough words that you can say that's a couch, that's red, you know, this is a head as opposed to the neck as opposed to the shoulders, uh, and go all down my body and name each part. Even if you just say top, middle, bottom, uh, you need to be able to have you need to be able to name everything you care about, or else the words will will mush around and language won't be transmitted accurately and it'll devolve. All right, and we've got time for one more question. Who's going to be the brave last questioner? I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> do you see any evidence of devolution of language presently? Like, is there some kind of a cyclical nature to our depth of vocabulary? And is tweeting really? <laughs> <laughs> as a maybe for example. example. For example. Um, I'm going to talk about something slightly different, but I think related. Sure. There are, even today, some kids who grow up without exposure to language. For example, undiagnosed deaf kids can grow up with no exposure to language that they can learn. They may see print, but not have the ability to connect it to things. Those people have lots and lots of trouble conceptualizing that a word is a word. Conceptualizing that you can make the same gesture and it means the same thing each time. Uh, some people have managed to bridge the gap, but uh, others can, can grow to be adults living in society, holding down jobs, and still communicating only with newly invented pantomime for each, each time they want to tell a story. They'll make up new gestures each time. They don't have words. 